In my remarks, I will offer a, an analysis of the Minsk agreement and of the Minsk process in the comparative context of the Greater Black Sea region and the conflicts there. It is a region of conflicts. I don't call them frozen conflicts. I call them conserved conflicts. They are not frozen to begin with, but they are conserved by this I imply a decision to conserve these conflicts by an undeclared consensus between Russia and the Western powers. It is a joint decision, undeclared, unannounced, unrecognized, but real, to conserve these conflicts, leave them unresolved for an indefinite period of time. And this is also something that we have to change. Um, last spring, when the uh, Russian aggression in Donbass started, many Ukrainian observers predicted the emergence of what they called a Transnistria in Donbass. I read that many times in the Ukrainian press. Something similar is happening, but not quite identical. What is the pattern of the conserved conflicts previously in Transnistria, Abkhazia, Ossetia? Russia organizes the conflict as its initiator. It presents the conflict as an internal conflict to that country. Russia alone is able to enforce the conservation of the conflict on the ground. It claims that the political solution must be mutually acceptable to both sides of the alleged internal conflict, which means a veto power to Russia's proxies and a solution on, in Russia's interests through those proxies or else indefinite conservation. Russia calls for a political solution after Russia had already imposed a military situation on the ground. So whatever political solution emerges eventually, it is the result of Russia's unilateral military action on the ground. This is why it is wrong for Western governments to say that the conflict in Donbass has only a political solution. Any conflict ends in a political solution. But in these conflicts, in the Black Sea region, Russia has unilaterally created a military reality, which then leads to a political solution that ratifies that military reality. So this is the pattern that has developed until now. How does the Minsk agreement differ from that? It, it is similar in the sense that I described, but the Minsk agreement introduces innovations, which are Russia's innovations accepted within the Normandy group. What are these innovations? First, the aggressor power wants to change the constitution of the aggressed country, and this is incorporated in the armistice agreement. This is without precedent. It is a Russian innovation in the Minsk agreement. In the same agreement, the aggressed country, Ukraine, is supposed to subsidize the social budget of territories on which Ukraine does not have any control. And thirdly, in the same Minsk agreement, the Ukrainian government is supposed to recognize the, local, the results of the local elections to be held in the Russian-occupied territory. And moreover, in the Armist Minsk Armistice Agreement, the OSCE's ODIR is almost instructed to prepare for election, local elections in Donbass, in the occupied Donbass, that would then be recognized as valid. The Minsk Agreement sets the stage for all this. This has never happened in the cases of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, or Transnistria. These are innovations that Frau Merkel and President Hollande have accepted in the Normandy group. The Minsk Agreement 
is also very unusual in that it contains both military and political stipulations. An armistice agreement is normally a military agreement. But the Minsk Agreement contains wide-ranging political clauses. Military clauses include withdrawal of so-called foreign troops. It doesn't name which troops. Maybe the troops of Zimbabwe. Foreign troops. And mercenaries. Mercenaries, of course, is a subjective category. It was wrong to put mercenaries in the Minsk Agreement. And there is no obligation for Russia to withdraw its troops. But these are the, on paper, the military clauses. And next, Ukraine would at some point regain control of the Ukrainian side of the Ukraine-Russia border in the zone of conflict. However, these military clauses are supposed to come at the very end of the process. In order to achieve the military clauses, Ukraine must first change its constitution by, nego by negotiation with the so-called People's Republics to fulfill those political clauses. Russia, would, Russia has suspended the Novorossiya project for the time being. At the present time, Russia has suddenly switched to the notion of a Ukrainian united political space in which the so-called People's Republics would be represented by an agreement to be negotiated with the central government of Ukraine. This, of course, as we all realize, would give Russia internal political leverage in Ukraine's constitutional processes and a vote in Ukraine's own national decision making. This is why I support and I applaud the vote by the Verkhovna Rada on March 17 regarding the local elections in the Russian occupied territory. The legislation adopted by the Verkhovna Rada on March 17 sets a number, a great number, of perfectly normal conditions for holding such elections and recognizing their validity. And that is the prior withdrawal of Russian troops, no elections to be held under the supervision or in the presence of the People's Republic's military forces, full freedom of campaigning for Ukrainian political parties, the elections to be administered by Ukraine's Central Electoral Commission, full media access to the occupied territory in order to hold fair elections. So these are the preconditions set by the Verkhovna Rada. One minute. One minute. Of course, the Russian side and the two people's republics will not accept this. And this means stopping that dangerous political process by which the two people's republics would have gained access to Ukrainian institution and decision making as a trade-off for the withdrawal of Russian troops and Ukraine regaining control of the border. But those clauses are unfulfillable because the Russian troops are not even mentioned as re being required to withdraw, and because any Ukrainian control of the Ukrainian side of the Ukraine-Russia border would have to be negotiated with the two so-called People's Republic. So it would not be Ukrainian control, it would be a fiction. It was a trap, and I think that the legislation adopted on March 17 is pointing Ukraine to the exit from this trap. Thank you.